we're going to get started. Charles Boston. He's Boston Rivers. Good morning. Good morning. P please be seated. This is just like my class. You really listen to me well. <laughs> Good, good morning, I'm, um, and, and welcome to today's symposium, Reimagining Criminal Justice in the 21st Century. I'm Mark Latham, and I'm a member of the faculty here, and among the courses uh, that I teach is a seminar in, on, on the use of force as part of our Master's in Restorative Justice program. And it is my privilege, true privilege today, to serve as the moderator for our first uh, panel. Now, b before I briefly introduce our panel members, uh, since the symposium materials have uh, information about them and their backgrounds in the field of criminal justice, I wanna recognize the members of BALSA for all the time and effort that they went into planning this important event. What you've accomplished today is, is remarkable. So let's give them a round of applause. So, so, so thank you, thank you. Now we have a lot to cover today, so it's important that we stay on schedule. Uh, each of our panelists, now listen to this, um, will share the, their thoughts on criminal justice reform for 10 minutes each, or else. Um, I don't know what the or else is, but or else. Um, and uh, the reason is, because we, we, we want to open this up to questions from you uh, as, qu as soon as we can. So the plan is that by 11.20, uh, we should do that, and we'll, we'll, we'll go till about 11.45. Uh, and to make sure we stay on schedule, uh, where's Rico? Oh, okay, Carla has, uh, will, will help us keep time. Now, um, on to our panelists. Uh, first, we have Eric Gonzalez, uh, who's district attorney for a distant suburb of South Royalton. Um, that would be the borough of Brooklyn, New York. Uh, next is Miriam Feliz from Suffolk uh, County, Mass, where she's a supervisor in the Chelsea District Court, and uh, she grew up in Chicago, as I did. So the Windy City is well represented here. Uh, then we have Robert Appel, who uh, did a really amazing thing. He did not attend law school, but he's a lawyer. He just studied on his own and took the bar and passed. That is remarkable, <laughs> remarkable. And then uh, Captain Gary Scott of the Vermont State Police, uh, who's the Director of Fair and Impartial Policing and Community Affairs for the State Police of Vermont. Uh, so, so thank you all for joining us. Uh, and we'll, we'll just march down the line here and begin with uh, Eric. So, so District Attorney Gonzalez, please take her away. Thank you. You don't think so. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a, a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank the Dean um, and Balsa for inviting me, especially Carla Usher, who uh, I worked with for many years in the District Attorney's Office in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, it's great to see you, Carla, and thank you for having me come up. I, I came up because the commitment to criminal justice uh, reform is something that's personal to me. I grew up in East New York in Brooklyn, for those who are familiar with uh, New York City, but East New York was uh, derisively called the murder capital of New York City in the 80s and 90s. And in fact, the neighborhood that I lived in um, was governed by one police precinct. That precinct is the 7-5 police precinct. Uh, the year I was applying to the district attorney's office, 126 people were murdered in my neighborhood alone. Um, that uh, caused me to become interested in public safety, um, but I lived in a neighborhood that obviously had a, a tremendous issue with uh, violent crime, but we also lived in a neighborhood that was uh, um, highly policed, and often um, the community uh, did not feel that the police had the best interests of the residents that lived there. And so it's an interesting dynamic growing up in a neighborhood that you actually uh, need safety, um, but don't trust the police to provide that safety. And that exists, unfortunately, today in many uh, communities especially communities of color. And so for me, 
um, I wanted to be a prosecutor to um, help change it. And long story short, after serving for 19 years as a, as a line prosecutor, the first African American uh, elected district attorney in Brooklyn history, Ken Thompson, was elected. Um, and he gave me the chance to serve as his chief assistant. I was the number two in the office, it's a very large office. We range anywhere from about 525 to 600 lawyers and another 600 employees, so 12, over 1,200 people that work in that DA's office. And we annually handle about 100,000 cases. Um, in terms of what happened is uh, um, my former district attorney, uh, Ken Thompson, passed away, and um, I was named the acting district attorney. I then ran for district attorney in 2017 and took office officially as DA in 2018. And the first thing that we did in Brooklyn is create something called a Justice 2020 plan. And that is a 17-point plan that was created by the community. So we heard our Attorney General here talk about having the community have a voice and help lead what um, safety and fairness looks like, what justice looks like for the community. And so that's what we did in Brooklyn. We got about 70 people, maybe more than that. Um, they were people from all walks of life. They were academics and law enforcement and ac um, clergy and, and formerly incarcerated folks and just everyone that we could think of and said, tell me about reimagining the justice system. Tell me what you would love this justice system to look like. Um, and they came out with many recommendations, and I adopted 17 of those recommendations that I would promise to get done in my first two years of office. So at, as we're in the beginning of 2020, um, we've completed 12 of the 17 recommendations. Um, when this was created, now this was being worked on in 2017, um, a lot of these were very ambitious goals. So for New York City, it was, um, my office became the first office in New York City that uh, refused to prosecute marijuana cases. Um, the, the racial disparities in Brooklyn were stark. Um, the office handled about 15,000 marijuana arrests a year in Brooklyn. Uh, the population is about 2.6 million uh, um, people. 93% um, of the people arrested for marijuana use in Brooklyn uh, were either black or Latino, 93%. And so we know that marijuana usage was pretty consistent among races. Uh, it was just an enforcement practice. And so we began changing how we handle certain things. and. Um, I'm not gonna get into all of Justice 2020, it's on the website, you can look at it, but it has four, I think, four pillars to it. Um, and I think the first one is the most surprising, which is we can keep our community safe by reducing incarceration. Re the reduction of incarceration, um, we believe, will actually keep our community safer because as the TJ, uh, Attorney General Donovan said, um, we put people in jail for, for things that don't directly go to public safety. And we create a cycle um, in our communities of imprisonment and supervision and rearrest and recommitment into our correctional facilities, and this stuff is not keeping us safe. So we're doing things much differently in Brooklyn. Uh, we have something called Brooklyn Clear. I no longer prosecute drug possession cases in a standard way. The police will make an arrest, and instead of sending out our district attorneys to write up the case, I send out peer counselors, um, mostly formally, um, you know, people who have uh, had their own addiction issues have come up, have you know, been clean for and sober for a long time, and they go to the precinct and they say, the district attorney does not want to prosecute this case, but you have to be willing to go into services. And they don't decide the service is that day, because they, we have social workers who go in and meet with them and figure out what people's social service needs are. But um, this year, last year alone, we were able to send 
uh, 800 people directly into services from the precinct. We do this in cooperation with the police department in New York City. Um, these are people that were never processed into the system and went directly into services. So when we talk about collateral consequences of, of convictions, there's also collateral consequences of being arrested. And this actually prevents anyone from getting, you know, fingerprinted, put through the system. There's no need to um, get a lawyer at arraignments. There's no, re no need to uh, go through a court system and plead guilty to then get services. This is completely outside the justice system. And I think as we reimagine our justice system, and I think this is a huge point, um, and I, I think, again, TJ um, mentioned it, we have to shrink what prosecutors do, right? Instead of sending the case before a judge to get someone services, we could do this outside of the justice system by working with partners in our community. And that's the second prong of Justice 2020, is engaging the community as true partners. We don't know everything. Um, we, we don't have all the answers in our justice system, but communities can get it together with help and, and money and services. They can figure out what safety and justice and fairness looks for them and how they want cases handled. So we're, we're sending cases back. People get arrested for shoplifting a low level. Um, crimes in Brooklyn, trespass, not in someone's house, but let's say on property. Um, and we send them back to community leaders who figure out what programming and what services they can look like, and they, they take on the responsibility of keeping that person with them. And so they're supervising them within the community, but outside of the justice system. Um, and, pre and keeping them close to home, keeping them with their families, helping them get employment, helping them get through school. And what we've seen in Brooklyn is by pushing these cases out, we're seeing a very low recidivism rate from those people who are actually able to provide and connect with services. And so that is counterintuitive to a lot of people who have grown up that the way we keep people safe is by locking folks up and, and keeping them in jail. But we all know, if we're honest with ourselves, that jail destabilizes people. People who go to jail lose the things that we know um, cause people to desist from crime. They lose jobs, they lose housing, um, they're often separated from family members and people who love them. And so all of those things actually don't keep us safe. They cause people to get into a cycle of, of criminal justice involvement. And so one of the things we're trying to do is shrink the size of our justice footprint. Not every arrest needs an intervention by a district attorney or a court. Sometimes the arrest is enough with a um, some sort of um, pr provision of services or the need, you know, the opportunity to get services. And we, we're fortunate in Brooklyn, and we have a lot of resources in New York City, so we're able to provide a lot of those resources, uh, but we have to also make sure in communities that don't have those resources that we're, um, we're, we're saying to our elected officials, we don't need more money for jails and prisons, um, we need more money to make sure that we can provide these services for our community members. And, and the third prong of this is um, by freeing up our prosecutors, from not handling cases that are not directly involved in public safety, um, focusing them in on the drivers of crime. Now, there's a, a, a really extraordinary thing, like I said, I, New York City has a lot of violent crime, like a lot of big cities. It's safer than most, it's the eighth safest state in the country. Um, but. We actually use our assistant district attorneys to focus in on the true drivers of violent crime. And that's how we've been bringing the homicide rate down. So I told you about in Brooklyn, my neighborhood had 126 homicides when I was applying to the DA's office. Well, last year we had seven in that same neighborhood. And for, yeah, you could clap to that because. <laughs> We, we do that by focusing on drivers of crime. 
a really interesting and in, in the academic um, and, and, and law enforcement will tell you that half of 1% is responsible for 60% of most violent crimes in neighborhoods. So if you can focus on a half a percent of the population, you can dramatically reduce crime. And so we do a little bit more than a half a percent in Brooklyn, but that's how we've been focusing crime. And the fourth piece to it, and then I know my time's up, I see Carla looking at me, um, <laughs> is the transparency giving the community the information exactly what we're doing in the DA's office. Um, there's so many racial um, disparities in our justice system and most people don't know what they are. And so we're making sure we're collecting data and that we're being very um, forthcoming. Um, just the, my last point on this, about two years ago, I told my assistant district attorneys that they could no longer seek bail on misdemeanor cases unless there was a public safety reason to do so. And if they were going to ask for bail, they had to write me a memo about why they wanted bail. We went from asking for bail on virtually 98% of all misdemeanor arrests down to 5.5%, and judges set bail on 3.5%, and crime continues to fall in Brooklyn. So only about 3.5% of the people who get arrested, that's over 65,000 people on misdemeanors, um, ever get bail set, and yet we, we continue to drive crime down in Brooklyn. Thank you. Thank you. So bear with me, I'm a little under the weather, so if you can't hear me back there, just raise your hand. Um, I'm honored to be here. I'd like to thank Balsa and the Vermont Law School for giving me this opportunity, um, as well as District Attorney Rollins. Um, I'm here in, in her stead um, to represent the amazing work that she's doing in Suffolk County in Massachusetts. Um, Suffolk County represents Boston, East Boston, Winthrop, Chelsea, Revere, um, and some state police properties. Um, for me as well, prosecution, criminal justice reform is a very personal topic. Um, it's something that um, as a Latina from the south side of Chicago, um, I grew up in a neighborhood that was riddled by violence, gangs, tensions between law enforcement and the community. Um, it was an immigrant community, so I obviously saw the, what we like to call collateral consequences, but they're not so collateral when you're talking about opportunity and people's liberties and freedoms, but how the criminal justice system actually impacts um, people's everyday lives and their opportunity to advance <clears throat> to get housing, um, to get affordable health care, to get education, um, to actually make a difference in their in their own lives and to, to move forward. Um, so for me, the way that I saw wanting change and wanting to implement that change in, in the criminal justice system that I was seeing that seemed unfair and disparate um, was to become a prosecutor. Um, and back when I wanted to do it, although it's not as long ago as some of my colleagues, but um, it was still anathema. Um, people were very much like, you're a Latina, you're a woman of color, why do you want to be a prosecutor? And my response to that was always, prosecutors have a tremendous amount of power. We make charging decisions, we make decisions about bail, we make decisions about sending people to jail, we make decisions about connecting people to services, whether to charge, whether not to charge. Um, and with great power comes great responsibility and, and I thought that that was probably the best way for me to use my perspective and where I came from um, to implement change in the criminal justice system. Um, and now, seven years into being a lawyer and being a prosecutor, um, I have the honor of doing that under Rachel Rollins, who actually ran and was elected on a platform of criminal justice reform. Um, and very much like um, District Attorney Gonzalez um, and some of the um, comments that um, Attorney General Donovan made, um, her platform was, I want, I envision a prosecution, a system where we're reducing incarceration, we're rectifying long-standing racial and ethnic disparities, um, we're implementing diversion and alternatives to prosecution. So prosecution's not just about charging someone um, and convicting someone. It means a lot more than that. Um, focusing resources on violent crimes and actual public safety concerns, um, and ultimately also breaking down barriers between law enforcement and the communities they serve, because that ultimately results in greater participation from the community um, in 
um, solving unsolved you know, homicides, for instance, um, and other perpetrators of violent crime. Um, so DA Rollins came into office, and the way that she did that was she convened a team of researchers and uh, data analysts and individuals who could put together both social science research um, and crime statistics and figure out what's going on in Suffolk County, how are we, what kind of crimes are impacting our neighborhoods, how are we currently prosecuting those crimes, and what, we can, what can we do to do a better job at that? What can we do to ensure that our communities are safer, um, but also that we are not creating you know, individuals who can't be productive members of our society? Um, and, and a big part of that is, as Attorney General uh, Donovan said earlier, you have a record and all of a sudden um, you can no longer access housing, you can no longer get employment, you can no longer vote. Um, and what does that result in? It, a revolving door of the criminal justice system, ultimately. Um, and that's one thing that we want to stop. And the only way to do that is to, is to change our shift, our focus, and our approach to prosecution. Um, and that includes essentially decriminalizing poverty, um, decriminalizing mental health il um, illnesses, um, decriminalizing substance use disorders, um, because oftentimes most of the crimes that are being prosecuted are not driven by a criminal intent of any kind, but rather these underlying systemic issues, issues of opportunity, access to um, services, and things of that nature. Um, so as a result of convening um, this team, essentially, of uh, researchers and um, people to troubleshoot, um, ultimately, DA Rollins put, to put out a what she calls the Rollins Memo. Um, I would invite all of you to um, visit the website um, and actually read it. It's a 66-page document, but it outlines her vision, um, and then it also sets forth how she's actually putting this into place. Um, and that's essentially we are, um, she created a list of 15. Um, during the research, what came about was that approximately 60% of the cases that were being charged were limited to 17 low-level nonviolent offenses. Um, so let's look at what those offenses are. Do we really need to be putting effort into prosecuting those versus connecting individuals to community services um, and wraparound services to address underlying issues? <clears throat> So in creating that policy, essentially, um, she calls it a do not prosecute list, a, the, where the presumption is those different crimes are not gonna be prosecuted, but instead, we're gonna connect people with um, substance use counselors, um, with housing, um, with education, in order to address underlying concerns rather than hold people on bail, um, put guilty convictions on their record for essentially um, crimes that are the result of um, things that they're suffering from as a result of their circumstances. So for instance, trespass is one of those crimes. Um, are we really gonna prosecute someone who broke into a vestibule because it's 20 degrees below zero outside and they have nowhere to sleep? Um, are we gonna criminalize and convict someone for having possession of crack cocaine where you know they've been homeless for a long time, became addicted, um, what are we really doing to help individuals and stop the revolving door of um, recidivism um, and actually giving people an opportunity to succeed and do better? Um, and she began, she implemented the policy in April of 2019, um, so it's coming up on a year now, um, and we've seen the true effects of this. Um, it allows prosecutors to focus on crimes, violent crimes. It allows um, individuals to get a second chance at life that they may not have otherwise had. Um, there was talk earlier about we see a police report, we see a BOP, um, a board of probation record, um, and that dehumanizes individuals. So what we've started to do is we have a conversation with attorneys and we're like, talk to your client, talk to me. Tell me how we can make this better. What can we do? Judges aren't always happy about it, um, asking for a second or a third call on a case, but it makes a huge difference when you're able to look across the aisle and know this person's story and make an informed decision about what to do and how to help. Um, and ultimately, what we have seen is that not only has overall um, have, you know, 
crimes in that area decreased, but also crimes and violent offenses have also decreased. Um, we've also seen an increase in victim and witness participation um, in violent offense crimes, um, showing that there's now an additional trust that's building between law enforcement um, and their partners uh, in the communities. Um, so we've seen a huge shift. I'm incredibly excited to be in the company of other law enforcement and prosecutors who envision this as being the new wave of prosecution um, and how we actually build a safer um, community overall. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Robert. <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> Good morning and thanks to Carly and Balsa for inviting me. I too am honored to be here. Um, I am here as a, a, a Vermonter by choice. I came here 50 years ago. It was a very different place. I actually grew up in Philadelphia and I know well where 17th and Montgomery is. Uh, it's in the heart of the North Philadelphia ghetto, which is one of the reasons I ended up here. Um, I was involved in supporting uh, black activism in Philadelphia in those days, and I had, uh, anybody remember Frank Rizzo? Yes. The mayor. Yes. Well, he was the mayor, but prior to that, he was the police commissioner, and um, he was really at war with the people of color in the city of Philadelphia. And I had um, cops draw guns on me. I, fortunately, my brother was kind enough to keep me from going after a cop with a log chain when I was 19, because I was <coughs> tired of being pulled over because I was a long-haired hippie. Um, so when, when I came here, and it's great to hear from Eric and Miriam about big city. We're 620,000 people in this state. Um, and like I say, it's a very different place than it now than it was when I arrived in 1970. It's refreshing for me to look around the room and see the number of people of color in the room, and I encourage those of you who are students of color to think about staying in Vermont. We have very few attorneys of color, and we have more and more defendants of color. And I heard repeatedly, I guess I'm the token criminal defense attorney up here, which I'm fine with, uh, from, from, from defendants of color, I'm not gonna risk my fate with an all-white criminal justice system. Don't see anybody of color on the jury panels. The way we, we pick jurors is still, to the best of my knowledge, licensed uh, drivers and people with landlines. You're gonna get a certain population. Uh, when I look around the room, I see more people of color here now than I did in my first decade in Vermont. It's true. Uh, and the storekeep in, in my little town in Cabot, Lower Cabot, would refer to black people as spear chuckers and think nothing of it. Like I say, it's a very different place now. Um, my neighbor, who was a very good guy, ended up being a late minister. He did not see a person of color until he was in the army. He grew up in rural Vermont in the 50s. Um, didn't see him on TV, it didn't exist. But that's changing now, and it's changing more dramatically in Chittenden County, which is where an effort was made 15 years ago, and there are people in the room who joined in that effort, Professor Seguino, uh, T.J. Donovan, I'm not sure who else is here on my vision. It's not what it used to be, but. Um, Sarah. Oh, Sarah George. No, I don't, you're too young for that. It's nice to see the next generation. You know, I, I take the long view. The gray in the beard is honest. Um, and there was a voluntary effort to collect race data uh, started in Chittenden County among four departments who volunteered to do that. And, th and the state police did join in, albeit second wave, but this was before it was required by statute. Unfortunately, our systems still don't talk to each other. We have computer systems in, in corrections that are disconnected from courts, they're disconnected from prosecutors, they're disconnected from defenders making data um, validation more challenging. And Stephanie, it's great to see you here. I too appreciate your work. I know you get criticized by some incessantly. Um, and I appreciated TJ talking about the data collection as a positive step, but we have a very balkanized criminal justice system in this state. We have 14 independently elected state's attorneys. Sarah among them 
who can basically approach criminal justice any way they want. Now, the AG has an opportunity to provide leadership, and I thank, thank TJ, who I considered a friend and colleague for the last 15 years, in providing that leadership. Of course, we still disagree from time to time, uh, but there's always respectful exchanges of, of perspective. So, um, so the race data showed dramatic disparities. Um, we, like many other areas, have had an influx of uh, refugee resettlement initiatives, uh, a number of Somalis, a number of Congolese, a number of uh, people from um, Tibet and other countries in East Africa. So in, in Chittenden County, um, in, I believe the percentage of students of color in the Burlington School District is about 40% now. So like I say, it, it, it is a changing environment in that corner of the state. And I don't know how many of you know Vermont well, but Chittenden County surrounding Burlington has a quarter of our population. If you get out in the sticks where I lived for 40 years, it still hasn't changed a whole lot. So, and I'm gonna borrow a phrase from one of Professor Seguino's former colleagues who unfortunately left us, uh, Professor uh, Rashad Sabaz, who would talk about black faces and white places. Uh, he was a student of Angela Davis, um, but when we started seeing the change in demographics, black faces in white places drew unwarranted uh, and intensive law enforcement scrutiny. We see it too with um, people with mental health issues. I mean, if you don't look like you're a Vermonter, you don't look like one of us, cops are gonna look hard at you. And unfortunately, they may grab you up for something that other people would be taken home for, like TJ talked about. Um, and I like to refer to the criminal justice system as the system of last resort. <coughs> We talk about our mental health system having hospitals or no refusal. They refuse patients. Corrections doesn't refuse people who are sentenced to them. I looked recently at the cost of corrections in the state, and we're spending a total of $163 million on corrections, which is close to twice what we spend on higher education, which is about $92 million. In that $163 million, uh, we're spending only three and a half million on educating people who we put in cages. We've reduced community high school in Vermont, which is the, or was the largest high school in Vermont, is within the correctional facilities. That's been reduced in funding. So, so we're putting people in cages, not providing them with education to the extent it's required or indicated, not providing them with drug treatment, not really providing them with mental health treatment, and then we expect a change in result when we put them back out on the street, back into the same communities without adequate supports. In addition, we're spending seven and a half million dollars a year to send 275 men to a private for-profit prison in Mississippi. So not only are we exporting people from their communities and their support systems, we're also exporting uh, correctional officer income and taxes to the state of Mississippi. Our overall prison population when I started this work in 1978 was about 400. It got as high as 2,600. Uh, when I started, there were 10 female beds. At one point, we were up to 220 women. The 80s and 90s, we, we were in lockstep with national trends in terms of the growth of prison beds. And basically, it was on lower level offenses, uh, a lot of drugs, um, a lot of driving offenses. And again, I think that's a, a, a misuse of our finite resources. Corrections used to put out a very thick book about what makes up their population. They haven't done it in about five or six or seven years. I don't quite know how, why. But one of my favorite uh, pieces of data when they put it out was of new male admissions under age 22, 90% were high school dropouts, and of that 90%, half were on individual education plans, meaning they had learning disabilities or some other form of disabilities. So we, we're criminalizing um, disability, we're criminalizing race, we're criminalizing psych disability. I really appreciated um, Eric's comment about 
trying to keep people out of the system by referring from precincts. Um, you have one advantage, you have one department that you can work with. In Vermont, there's about 75 different local law enforcement agencies. Uh, when I talk about balkanized, I mean balkanized. There, there's been a trend in the last decade or so to have model policies that are required to be enacted by <coughs> each agency um, by legislative fiat. And that's starting to solidify, but um, different prosecutors, different police agencies have different philosophies about criminal justice reform. Some are very much on board, some are not. It leaves us with a very um, checkered and unpredictable system. Uh, and we, we do not provide meaningful pre-trial supervision. This is my confession of a defense attorney. Once you bring somebody in the system and you assign them a lawyer, my job is to try to minimize the impact on them. So what do you do when you're arraigned? Enter a not guilty plea. What do you do when the next time you come back for a calendar call in a month? You reinforce that. In my view, the time to grab hold of an individual who is exhibiting problems in the community is at the time they are found to have been in, it, been in that situation, in a jail cell, uh, in a hospital, realize that they can't continue to live the way they're living, that's the time to make referrals to community support services. <clears throat> Not after they've been in the system, because as you both have said, once you're in, it's you're in. damn hard to get out. You're tarred with a, you know, even without a conviction, you have a rest record. Um, and the collateral consequences, again, that was an enactment by our legislature. Now, when you plead out, you have to acknowledge these collateral consequences. And there's like 12 that are listed, and it's probably more like 200 that we don't know about. I mean, everywhere you turn, you're up against it because you've had criminal justice involvement. Um, what else do I want to say? Um, Carla, what, one minute. All right, thank you. <laughs> Maybe I, I'll yield my time to Gary, but um, let me just, just close, and this is a good transition because uh, the Vermont State Police is our largest law enforcement agency. It has statewide jurisdiction. 300 sworn officers, somewhere in there. I take my hat off to the, to the state police, not to say that there's still not more work to be done, but um, Major Jonas, who was Director of Fair and Impartial Policing before um, Captain, thank you, <laughs> Captain Scott took over. There has been a real commitment by the state police to breathe life into these policies. They've done internal training, they hold people to account, the, da the disaggregated data down to the trooper level enables supervisors to hold individual troopers to account. To me, that's a model for the other 74 agencies. We're not there yet. There's much more work to be done, which is usually how I end these conversations. So let's keep doing the work and thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Robert. Uh, Captain Scott. I am not a lawyer. <laughs> Proud to say. <laughs> Uh, again, thank you very much for uh, inviting the state police to be here, Carla, the law school. We're, we're really happy to be here and to talk about what we have been doing for uh, about 15 plus years uh, in the area of fair and impartial policing. Um, Major Jonas is here. She was the first director uh, of fair and impartial policing for the state police. I'm the second. I think we're the only state police agency in the country that has this job title. Uh, and it's based on the commitment that we've had since about 2006 to really be committed to how we are dealing with our communities of everyone who comes to Vermont, uh, lives in Vermont, and how we really can work with everyone and make sure we're doing it the best way we can. And uh, as Robert just said, there's always more work to be done. We're not ever gonna have a, a flag in the ground say we've made it. So there's just a, it's a big commitment and we've been involved in it for a long time. Uh, so a little bit about the agency. We have about 333 uh, sworn members. We have three divisions. Um, the field force division is the uniforms you see around, uh, the Mark Cruisers. We have a detective division. 
um, what's known as BCI, all the major crimes, and then we have support services, which Major Jonas oversees and I'm part of, which is basically the training and recruitment and you know all computers and all that type of stuff. It's the back end support services for the agency. And uh, we, we had a commander in about 2006 that saw uh, a report that was in southern Vermont that was uh, communities of color were talking about how they were receiving disparate treatment by law enforcement. And that raised uh, his, his eyebrow to that. He met, went right and met with Curtis Reed, who many in this room know, and said, how can we do that better? How can we not be part of this problem? What can we do to fix it? And we've been on this course since then, uh, setting up a fair and impartial policing committee, which is really engaging community members to come. We meet here, the law school, uh, four times a year. Um, and it's community, Robert's been to that. Stephanie's obviously been a big partner of coming to that. As many people in the room have been to that meeting uh, throughout the years. And so that sort of set, the signals of what we needed to do internally to change the culture within our agency. And the big part of that was uh, senior leadership. Uh, if the senior leadership is promoting that message down to our members, it's gonna really resonate with our members of what the culture is of what we wanna have in our agency. So language, terminology, recruiting, what, how do we hold people accountable, all those things started to take shape over the years and uh, we're, we continue to be a, a work in progress in how we can do that. But uh, so I'll sort of cut through some of uh, one of the, the things that we continue to do. So recruiting and hiring has been a big thing. Taking our, we have the resources and the ability to have recruiters leave Vermont and try to attract communities of color to come to Vermont and be, you know, which is difficult as many would say around here. As we see a population decrease, we see, uh, young Vermonters leaving, uh, how do we get people to come here? So we've sent recruiters to predominantly black universities up and down the East Coast. We say, come to Vermont. They're like, no, it's too cold. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> Not as cold as it used to be. Right. <laughs> so we, it's a challenge. Uh, we continue to try to figure out how we can do that better. And um, while we continue to try to get people up here, we, we, when we looked at our recruiting process, we have to take a look at the, the tests that we, we administer and the biases that are involved in that. We see that uh, members for the state police, the people, the applicants that are taking it, 50% uh, people of color fail the test. And so that's an issue that we continue to dive into and figure out why that is happening. Uh, when someone does take the test and they pass it and they come to an oral board, which we just had yesterday was part of, uh, before they sit down with our oral board uh, command staff to have their questions and answers period, we hand them a piece of paper that asks, what will you bring in way of cultural diversity to the Vermont State Police? And so it's messaging, right? We're starting to the process of that applicant early on about what are the values of our agency. And they write down what they write down and then they come into the oral board. And when they come into an oral board with us, we ha have questions that have been given to us from community members around the state of scenario-based situations. So we're starting again, messaging to them of what's a value of us and then learning about this applicant, asking them if they come in contact with a transgender person on a motor vehicle stop. They present as female but hand a male license. How are you gonna handle this car stop? Uh, a lone black male uh, in a car at a gas station late at night. How are you gonna respond to the situation and let them sort of think through that? And it gives us the opportunity up front to see what type of candidate we're getting. It's the values that they're starting to see, the messaging of what is important to us. Um, and we've also engaged, to get these questions, we've engaged a lot of various communities around the state. Um, Chittenden County has a huge immigration population, migrant immigration population that we have reached out to, especially new um, African Americans that have come here. Uh, and one of our successes was just yesterday, a young man who uh, landed in Burlington from a refugee camp in 2004, applied with the state police, and his reasoning was because he wants to give back to the state that has given him so much. And it was just great to be sitting in the room to hear someone talking about that and what he wants to do and the values that he holds were in line with what we hold as an organization. Uh, Thankfully, he, did, he rocked it, he was excellent, and he's moving on in the process, so hopefully that all carries out in some way. Um, so which leads to the next part of training. Uh, how do we hold our members accountable? How do we train them? How do we give them the tools of uh, 
what we try to combat all the time of this implicit bias, explicit bias, implicit bias, how do we have our members recognize it? What type of training can we put in place for that? Um, we had uh, Dr. Lori Fordell, who's a national leader in implicit bias, come and do a training for us, and, and then we've also had community members help us design programs that we can use to you know, sort of train the trainers internally to make sure our members are getting everything and they start to understand what implicit bias is and how much it effect it has them when it comes to traffic stops or just in encounters with people on the street. And uh, we've, it's been successful in some ways, but it's still not there yet. When we look at sort of what we can do better, it's an, we, we continue to evolve to see what is the next step on how we can continue to train our members to really recognize us and how these processes really work out. Um, so our recruits, when we, when we take them in, in the first three weeks, they sort of go through a state police process and then there's a 16 week academy for every law enforcement agent, uh, officer in the state that everyone's mixed together. During the first three weeks, we have uh, uh, a community member, Dr. Eitan Nazred Nlongo, he's the chair of the Attorney General's Racial Disparities Panel. He comes in and meets with our recruits and talks to them about the history in our country and how we've gotten to where we are and start to just address very quickly about what uh, what racial tensions and police interactions are. So again, more messaging to our recruits early on in the process. They go to the academy and there is a, throughout the academy during scenario-based scenarios, motor vehicle law, criminal law, there's again this messaging of implicit bias, how it can be you know worked through the, through the agency, what they can do with that. Post graduation, we keep our recruits for a bit of, uh, we do some additional training. Um, we have, again, early on, we have uh, Curtis Reed come. They watch the documentary, The 13th. They take the implicit Harvard, uh, the Harvard implicit bias test. And it's an education, it's a full day of training again before we have our members enter the field into a field training process. Um, supervise, supervision and accountability. We have a web-based real-time uh, accountability process for our members. If someone is involved in three pursuits in a certain amount of time, their supervisors now will see that, it pops up to them in an email, and then we look back at all of those pursuits and see what happens. Same thing with use of force. How many, if they've been involved in uses of force, their direct supervisors will pull that out and then again review all of the cases to see if there's common denominators there that we maybe have missed and we can start to track with that officer and use it as a, a training tool to see if we can do it better. Uh, we, our senior commanders have a strategic plan where fair and impartial policing is one of the pillars. So they have to come to headquarters every year, meet with the majors and talk about how they are meeting or not meeting the goals within their units for fair and impartial policing. So the detective units, field force, the 10 barracks all have to come in and talk about this every year. So again, more messaging, they have to have a plan, they have to stick to their plan and they have to show results for that plan. Um, we also have a, a, a internal, oh, you're killing me now, one minute left. <laughs> so, um, for internal review or internal uh, uh, review processes of complaints against our members, our, our web page has the ability for people to file complaints against our troopers on through Facebook, through Twitter, through the web page, through Collins, anywhere right there. And our policies are translated to Spanish and French and English, so people can take a look at that uh, and try to be as open as we can. Outreach to uh, marginalized communities has been one of the things that I've really been tasked with and done a lot of work with. I have uh, an, a group of tribal leaders that are in Chittenden County that I can meet regularly with and speak with when we do have tragedies. So we've had several young uh, people drown over the last several years that are, are new Americans and the language barriers and the culture differences that when we were able to have the, the informal leader from that community meet with the detective before going to the family's house to make those notifications, it has made that process go so much more smoothly and developed the trust and transparency that we've heard about. And that's a, a been a big part and a big success for us coming out of these tra tragedies. So 
Uh, and the last thing, you know, traffic collection, that is something we look at, we release every year, we put it up on our website for people to see and analyze and look at. We look at Stephanie Seguino as a partner with us. We don't always agree, but we definitely uh, hear the message and she's pushing us in the direction, pushing us correctly in the right direction sometimes uh, that we need to really listen, listen to and look internally of how we can do a better job with all that. So I'll, I'll yield my time there and I know there's a couple other things that people have questions. Thank you, thank you. So, so we have Plenty of time for questions. We have a microphone, um, and, and I would urge the students, particularly, now's your chance to practice cold calling, right? Uh, you can call on any of our panelists, um, and so uh, we look forward to your questions. So, 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 so I have a, a question while um, people think about this uh, that's really directed toward uh, uh, Captain Scott. And um, I, I mentioned I teach a use of force course, and, and I think one, one of the things that can really destroy trust between a community and, and the and law enforcement um, officers is when uh, use of force is used. Um, and in thinking about that, uh, in, in light of the fact that the vast majority of, of law enforcement officers never use their firearm, is that correct? That's correct, hopefully. You're in cross-examination now. Um, <laughs> so um, in light of that, why not, what, what if he disarmed, not all police, but a fair number of the police and just so, so they didn't have have access to a firearm. Stupid idea, naive. Or <laughs> I think it'd be pers uh, so. Uh, that's not my area of expertise, use of force and all of that. But uh, so I'll go with that. Vermont, that I think would be very pretty difficult. I worked night shift for ten years in Lamoille County, as T.J. was talking about, Chittenden County, northern Vermont, and uh, it was almost every car stop you make, there is a firearm involved in those car stops with, because you know, as many of you know, Vermont, that we have firearms everywhere. So that, that would put it at a, an immediate disadvantage in some of those cases. So obviously, I've never had to use my firearm and it's always gone well, but I think that would be a lot more difficult to, for, and we work by ourselves. So I would cover Lamoille County at night by myself and with maybe Stowe police officer and a Morrisville police officer. Mm. So three police officers covering an area geographical size, almost the size of Rhode Island. Um, so I think that is just, it would probably turn people away from wanting to be a police officer in Lamoille County for if I would think about it. So I think it's, you, to your point though, it is, you know, it, it's an area that, uh, of concern, obviously, when we look at force, it's you. I think uh, we uh, we put all our police shootings, the state police shootings, up on our web page as they occur, um, and try to keep that data up to up to speed with everyone to see. But it's I think it's a tricky and a complex issue to really look at what is the best solution for all that. And we're talking about how fr infrequently firearms are used by law enforcement. Thank you. Questions from the audience. Oh, and if you just uh, w w would uh, state your name, please, for you. Okay. Uh, Kim Anderson, and I work in the field of restorative justice. And I'm just wondering from the New York and Massachusetts perspectives, uh, since you're not looking at prosecuting some of those lower level crimes, what, what are you doing with those folks? And what are the collaborations that you've made to move those folks out of the system? In Brooklyn, we have a program called uh, Project Reset. And what happens is when the police make an arrest on, the, and there's a list of like 35 eligible crimes, when they make an arrest in one of those cases, they notify our office. We then um, have a social worker and a member of the community review the case with our district assistant district attorney, and when we believe appropriate, we'll go down to the precinct um, with a community member or a social, a social worker and figure out what services a person should go into. We don't actually require the completion of the program, but we do require substantial participation. So the person has to enter the services, start getting treatment, um, and at that point, we will decline to prosecute the arrest so the case doesn't come into the system, but there has to be participation in the program. And so out of eight, out of about 
last year we screened about a thousand cases in that way. Um, about 800 people entered, 600 of those people were successful um, having gone through services. The, the beauty of the, of the program is that most of these are not one-time things. They've been wrapped around services, so the person stays with the organization or the connection has been made. So if the person is dealing you know, with substance use disorder or a mental health issue, they can reconnect to services, but the service providers stay with them. They're not just providing service because of the arrest. They're kind of being uh, assigned to that service provider. And so that is kind of the, the goal is to get services at that moment. And, and really, you know, the, the belief and, in, in, you know, I should say that I'm lucky because our police department is um, participating and cooperating in this process is that that person is at the lowest moment, right? The officer has just put handcuffs on them, has dragged them into the system, and now um, they're about to spend possibly 24 hours in, in lockup before they see a judge. This is a time of crises for them where we're most likely to have a social worker or in, in terms of our drug cases, our peer counselor, get to them and uh, convince them that they don't want to come through the system, they'd rather connect with these services. So in Suffolk County, something very similar, we do something very similar. Um, I can tell you that, <coughs> Excuse me. Um, in the Chelsea area, for instance, um, there's a program called the Hub Program, um, and it actually is community partners and law enforcement. We meet on a weekly basis and actually identify community members and families that are in need. So that can range from individuals suffering from mental health um, concerns, substance use disorders, everything from homelessness to domestic violence, um, and actually the team then creates a plan for that individual or that family, um, whether or not that individual is court involved. Um, additionally, there's a downtown task force, again, in Chelsea, where the police department has an entire unit of officers um, that engage with community members and can um, actually identify those individuals that are recurring, um, you know, individuals who are struggling with alcohol, um, drugs, mental illness. Um, I will often get a call before the person even gets placed under arrest and saying, you know, so and so is coming into the court. Um, can you call CAPIC or North Suffolk Mental Health? And then I will place a phone call and actually have that service provider in the courthouse um, so that when he or she comes into the courthouse, we can actually directly connect them because I agree it's important to get them at that point in time versus having the case arraigned, having them go through the system, and then at some point then trying to connect that individual to services. Thank you. <coughs> Tell if it's on. Okay. Um, I'm concerned specifically about restitution. Your name? Oh, I'm sorry, Mary Lynn Isham. Thank you. Um, I'm concerned specifically about restitution uh, and asking the folks from other states. Do you have data on the repayment of restitution of folks who are in the system, have gone through the system, but have had their cases expunged? Vermont's having some d dialogue right now about expungement of cases and Restitution is where my focus is because of the work I do. Restitution to victims? Restitution to victim survivors um, due to the losses, financial losses caused by the crimes committed. So restitution is often used when we are, you know, I didn't speak about this, but we do have a restorative justice program that we use in Brooklyn and, you know, and largely in part of us you know, believing that a person has taken responsibility and is, you know, being accountable for the harm that they've caused, um, they are often asked to pay restitution, and that is something that is monitored. We have an office um, within our courthouse that uh, continues to work with uh, people who have come through um, the system to make sure that they continue to pay their restitution. It's often, you know, over a period of time. Uh, but generally, in our, you know, the exp you know, generally, um, you can't get your case expunged. We we don't really have expungement in New York State, but we do have sealing. But generally, you can't get your case sealed um, unless restitution has been completed. 
Uh, so that is something that has to be done first. Uh, New York State has very stringent laws on what cases can be sealed. Um, there's a, there's a t it has to be over 10 years old. You can't have more than two have been committed, you know, convicted more than twice. Uh, there's a number of rules, but one of the rules is that re all restitution has been paid before you're eligible. The only expungement we have at all in the state is for marijuana offenses, but all other crimes, the best we can do is have a, a record sealed. Um, difference is that record still exists for law enforcement purposes, as opposed to the expungement really wipes out, erases that conviction. I mean, it's very similar in Suffolk County. I think one thing that we can't overlook, however, is that oftentimes individuals don't have the ability to pay. Right. Um, and so it's walking that fine line of someone's been victimized um, and suffered some harm, but at the other side you have an individual who just simply can't pay. So um, it, it goes back to, okay, is there a way for us to help this individual find employment and get a job and at least make some payments towards that restitution, but um, at least in, in mass there is uh, a hearing about whether or not an individual even has the ability to pay. Um, and that's always a sticking point, obviously, with, with survivors as well as with, um, you know, how do you convince the person who's been harmed that we can't really force someone who doesn't have the ability or the resources, um, but that you've also been harmed and the, the right result is not simply incarceration because a person can't then pay. So it's something that we're actively struggling with, um, but it's definitely an issue that comes up quite a bit is whether or not a person even has the ability to pay. But ultimately, um, if someone's been put on a restitution payment plan, um, it's the same as in, in Brooklyn, where you, your case is not going to be officially closed until you pay that restitution, or a judge steps in and says, this person no longer has the ability to um, to pay and therefore closes the case. I'd, li I'd like to offer a comment on restitution. I recently learned that after Florida passed a law that reinstated voting rights to persons convicted of felony in the state of Florida, you don't get your right to vote back until you make all back payments of fines, restitutions, et cetera. By memory, about one in 10 African-American men in <coughs> Florida are disenfranchised based on felony conviction. So if you think about Florida being a swing state and the efforts to suppress voter turnout among certain communities, I, I agree with Miriam that you know if, if somebody doesn't have an ability to pay, is it really just to take away a fundamental right to vote? I don't think so. Uh, hello, uh, Jameson Davis. Uh, I'm going to stand behind the camera. Um, so a lot of thoughts. I'm trying to work my thoughts into a question form, so bear with me. Um, I have personally had the opportunity to work with uh, Captain Scott and Major Jonas, and the camera's right here. <laughs> Even closer. Nice try. Uh, uh, yeah, so I've had the opportunity to, to be a part of the panel, uh, the AG's panel that dealt with disparities in juvenile justice system. I've been to the meetings here on campus, so I've really um, seen the progressive work that you guys have done. Um, I have a very love-hate relationship with data, leaning a little bit more towards hate over the previous, over the more recent years. Um, and the reason for that is just because um, oftentimes in our community when we go through things and we try to express what we're going through, the first thing that we hear that is needed is data to prove the things that we are going through, as if our word is not bond, as if our word is not good enough, um, and there's more information somewhere magically out there um, outside of what we've already expressed, the ways that we've expressed it. Um, so I know that the state police has been a leader in this instance. Um, I know the state police has done a, a really good job with collecting data. I do also know that I believe the report was released about six months ago, maybe a little bit shorter or longer, um, and the data has showed that behavior hasn't changed really much at all. Um, maybe I think even if I can remember, it has gotten a little bit slightly worse in terms of stoppage and things of that nature. So what I'm wondering is what is happening and how do we protect the communities that need our protection during this quote unquote data retrieve time? 
um, because what's, as we know, while this data is happening, which takes years, there's no data you can get that would be worth actually having and keeping that's gonna be a short amount of time. Uh, what's happening in terms of holding anybody accountable, whether that's police, whether that's in the judicial system, whatever the case may be, in terms of when we see these, these grievances and these, and these violations of people's civil rights um, or this continued preparation of, perpetuation, excuse me, of uh, uh, oppressive systemic ways, um, how do I feel comfortable knowing that things are done or being done behind the scenes and what are those things in particular that are being done, whether it's discipline, uh, what does that look like training wise? I know the local level is always a, a very grievous uh, or tough conversation to have, as, as I say, in terms of making sure they are on top of their training in terms of implicit biases and things of that nature. Um, and though I'm you know, kind of looking towards Captain Scott here, that goes towards really everybody on the panel in terms of you know, practicing the legal field, you know, if you're dealing with um, you know, protective custody for children as well. All these instances are intersectional to the black experience here in Vermont, especially as we all know, being the less than 1%, but also being the highest population in the juvenile justice system, in the regular courts, dealing with children issues, all the above. We are the leaders in all these categories, which then turns to creating jobs for more white oppressors. That was a lot. <laughs> I wouldn't even begin to know to answer <laughs> those so, 20 questions. <laughs> I've had it, Captain Scott. Uh, so the first part for us, for the data, it has gotten better, uh, but it's not something that we look at as the stand, like we, the data and data, that's not how we've ever really approached that. We look to listen to k stories of people and their lived experiences in Vermont, and that's what's shaping of a lot of our training. That's why we bring community members in to train our members. So that's, the, you know, we, we use the data as sort of the blood pressure as to steal Stephanie's line of the agency. Okay, that's one point in this whole process of all these things that we need to look at. The second part I think I heard you talk about is holding people accountable. How do we hold our members accountable? So when it comes to traffic stops, every motor vehicle stop for us has a video with it. And so if uh, a lot of times that, if there's a complaint made after, we have the ability to go back and look at that video. If there is criminal cases, litig the litigation process will a lot of times play that out of what there's any type of behavior uh, misconduct from our member that needs to be brought uh, to back to the station. The state's attorney's office will frequently bring that right back quickly. Uh, I know Sarah and I have had many conversations about that and where those, you know, what 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 we should and should not be doing in some certain search, excuse me, certain situations. We do have a very robust internal affairs process that's legislatively mandate. So we take I mean, people can, as I said earlier, people can complain in a number of ways. Um, and when they enter in, we are able to review that internal complaint and through the process, it ends up with our, our commissioner of public safety is appointed by the governor, it's a civilian. We have a civilian oversight, uh, the state police advisory committee that looks at every internal affairs and then they guide us with the uh, making sure the the, the recommendations that are provided are appropriate for what has happened in that complaint. Um, so we, and then accountability just at the very basic level of hearing <coughs> complaints that come in on troopers, reviewing videotapes, reviewing their cases, and seeing what can be done. So a lot of times it's not uh, discipline, it's a corrective action that needs to be taken place with individuals of how they engaged into traffic stops or encounters with the public, so. <coughs> if I may add, that's, that's an internal um, <coughs> effort to promote accountability. There are certainly external procedures available to folks in Vermont. Um, my career has been split between civil rights enforcement, both in the AG's office and as director of the state's Human Rights Commission, we have a uh, Public Accommodations Act that applies to state police and local police. So if you feel you've been treated differently because of your membership and protected category, be it race, national origin, color, et cetera, you can file a complaint with the Human Rights Commission. In addition to that, there are 1983 actions that can and are brought against law enforcement agencies in the state of Vermont, usually in federal court, and I'm involved with several of them now. So internal is, is great, but in order to hold the internal accountable, you need to access the external, in my view. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Concepcion Cruz. Um, my question actually is for Miriam. Um, actually, I wanted to applaud all of you for the changes that you're trying to implement uh, for what I refer to as human rights. Um, but I guess my question was, uh, when do you, do you ever feel like you get blowback from the community for, say, when, as like you were saying earlier, when someone gets arrested, you hook them up with, you know, try to hook them up with like housing, and mm -hmm. do you do you ever get blowback from the community, like they're being rewarded for their crimes? Um, and there's a, a second part to this question, but if you. So as to the first part of your question, so obviously the, the DA's plan went into effect April of 2019, and so we're still dealing, obviously, with the repercussions of implementing that, and a big part of that was, wait, so we're just not prosecuting people anymore, right? That was the, the immediate knee-jerk reaction was, we're just letting people get away with engaging in criminal behavior, um, and it's a lot more complicated than that, and I, I was talking to James from the ACLU earlier, and I, I was saying, you know, we don't live in a black and white world and people don't like that. We, we, we live in a gray area and we have to be okay with like struggling with how to implement these policies um, and deal with them. And what I have actually found, and, and I have a pretty good, I guess, data point because Chelsea is a smaller community, a smaller neighborhood, but still very, it used to be amongst the 100 top dangerous cities in the country. And what we've actually seen is that in working with the community and business owners and mom and pop shops, um, there's now an understanding of when we actually you know, use wraparound services and assist people, that actually makes their business is safer, it makes the community safer, it makes, it builds actually relationships um, between law enforcement and the community. Um, there's absolute backlash right now. Um, I think people are still trying to, we like, some people love data, we don't yet have the data um, to appease kind of the, the folks that are thinking, okay, we're rewarding bad behavior, but I can, I can personally attest to the actual benefits of what we're doing, um, and we're gonna have to deal with the criticism um, because it's still a relatively new process, but I do think ultimately it's making a difference. And I just wanted to add to that. The answer is yes. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of people, you know, we have a program in, in my office where we uh, work with uh, a, a, a program that's educating people in prison. And I was at church and speaking about the program and how this allows us to help in reentry and you know the recidivism rate for those folks who are in prison and get their degrees is so low. Um, and someone said, "Well, I have to pay for my kids' uh, college tuition. Why do we have to give people who've been convicted, you know, free education?" And so there's always going to be those who think we're rewarding someone by providing services or you know helping them but obviously um, those who are committed to this work understand that w this is how you you prevent and have people desist from crime is providing the services that often led them uh, cognitive behavioral issues or other issues that led them to commit crime in the first place and if you don't deal with housing if you don't deal um, with helping getting employment my office helps people get jobs um, there was another person who was very critical um, I had a, a, a man who was arrested and uh, we were able to get him into a driving school program that cost about $5,000. Um, the person donated it to our office so he could get a CDL. And so now he has a great job. But again, someone else said, well, you know, I had to pay for my CDL. But this is a person who is who's now, you know, um, I think going to live a very productive life. So the answer is yes. Um, you have to balance, obviously, you know, concerns um, that our taxpayers have with this, but we understand that if you want people not to commit crimes, you actually have to do something more than just throw them in prison and expect when they come out that they'll be fine. Thank you. Um, and then the, just the second part of this question was... Um, a quick you know, question. Okay, I know you mentioned the uh, uh, Rollins memo and all these changes that you're implementing, and I was wondering if like once someone is newly elected, are those, those are those policies moot, or, or are they what's good for the goose is good for the gander kind of thing? I don't know if that. 
So someone can always right. I mean, the people are elected, and when they come back, and they come, if somebody were to to replace uh, District Attorney Rollins, they can always come in and, and institute their own policies. Um, they they'll have to deal with at that point any backlash from or or support, right? I mean, from undoing or redoing um, what predecessors have done. But you know, she had I. I practiced under District Attorney Dan Conley, and I thought he was a great District Attorney, um, and and sometimes change needs to happen, and if a new person comes in, they can, in fact, change the policies at that point. Thank you. So we have time for one more question. <coughs> okay, thank you. But thank you for your patience. That's okay. Uh, my name, can you hear me? Good. Okay. <laughs> my name is Fazilia Chinda, and sometimes I ask it, go in, you can understand me very well, because I'm to, to repeat again, I'll be okay. So this question goes straight to Captain Kerry. <laughs> So, like, example, like a police officer stopped someone and they found out that he's a mother of three and then the mother was drunk and do drug, whatever it is. So what is going to be the consequences of the mother? Is he, she going to, um, they're going to take away the child and then she's not going to see them again? Or what if she she's going to get clean, you know, getting better? Is he, sh they going to hold account um, accountability for our own action? Is he, she going to relieve the path? Uh, uh, the past of what she has done, she she, she, she gonna see her kid again. Well, uh, what's gonna happen to that family? So that's kind of my question. So, so make sure I understand it. A, a DUI arrest, and she has. Yes, yes. Yeah, she gonna have a DUI, and then she. My my question is, is this she gonna be able to see her kid again? What's gonna be? What is the consequences she gonna have to bear for that? Because she gonna see the mother, if, 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 um, even though she made a mistake, but there's any possibility that she's gonna be able to go back to her family again because she was doing, she was drinking and do drug at the same time. So I don't know what's gonna happen to the I mean, mother. Ba based on what you've given me for information, that's a, a normal DUI arrest. And usually if the kids are in the car, the, the for, our, for the state police would look to uh, just get them to a family member. That's the first option always. And then she would be processed for DUI. She would be released on a citation. She wouldn't be, if there's no other, any other factors in this arrest that you're talking about, she'd be released and that would be the end of it. She would go right back to her family after oh, okay. the, the processing. Uh, we don't have, uh, they wouldn't be held in court, uh, in jail, excuse me, if, unless there was some other type of circumstances there. But she would be released and she would go back to her family okay. within probably less than four hours, three hours usually, the processing, and that would be it. Thank you. That's normal. Hey, actually, the, the, the final, final question. Yes, sir. <laughs> Okay. Uh, my name is Wilda White. I live in Poultney, Vermont. Um, I've actually came to Vermont first in the in the 70s, um, and I do want to just say I just make a little comment to what Captain Scott said is that I have seen a change in Vermont State Police, and it was kind of funny because I was pulled over, and the officer said to me, "Hey, I know you're used to people pulling you over because of your race, but I want to assure you that my stop <laughs> is legitimate." <laughs> <laughs> so, I, <laughs> so you're getting through to somebody some way. <laughs> Why were you? Still doing it? <laughs> but uh, on a on a more serious note, um, one of the things I'm involved in is uh, activism on behalf of people who are discriminated against because of mental illness, um, and. Because this panel is reimagining uh, criminal justice in the 21st century, I wanted to uh, just uh, offer a comment that maybe you can comment on, because I don't know how to phrase it in a question I'm not going to pretend to since we're time pressured. But um, what I'm concerned about is uh, the preservation of oppressive systems through transforming them into something new. And what I see happening is trans, uh, transforming mass incarceration into mass medicalization. Um, that is uh, maintaining control over black and brown bodies through a, simply another carceral system, and in this case, the mental health system. For some reason, people think that racism has passed over the mental health system, and once we get them to that system, they're going to be somehow better off. Uh, but I can say from personal experience that the uh, mental health system is uh, just as racist, if not more racist, uh, than the uh, carceral uh, system that you folks represent. Um, 
And I think also one of the things that if we're reimagining um, criminal justice in the 21st century, that we have to recognize that none of us is any one thing. And we need to talk more about the intersections with race, with gender, with um, mental health or mental illness, because what I hear today is mostly based on the video and what people are saying, you kind of think this issue only touches men. However, women are the fastest population growing in prisons. Um, and you seem to um, not understanding the intersection of mental health, illness, and race, well, we're gonna be much worse off than someone who's white. True. I'll take a, a preliminary shot at it. So for me, um, most of what we're trying to do in Brooklyn, you know, we're, we're phrasing it as harm reduction. Right, so as we're trying to move cases out of the justice system and it's entirely and make referrals to places like mental health or other social services, um, and this is why I said um, before that I don't require the completion of programming, I just require substantial participation uh, because you know, coming out of a you know, unorganized uh, problem-solving court system that New York State was, you know, very applauded for. I saw that when people did not complete mental health treatment, did not complete drug uh, treatment, that the response was just to throw them in jail. Um, so in terms of the issues that are underlying, you know, uh, mental health treatment in hospitals and, and that, um, I think for me in terms of dealing with it as a law enforcement person is to understand that when someone hits a roadblock in their treatment, whether it be you know, you know, addiction issues or it be mental health issues, that the response does not mean that now the DA now has to go back, pick up that same case and go forward with it. And so to continue to work with the person, to continue to get services, um, to not make the fact that whatever, um, you know, procedural and, and justice issues and, and racist issues that may be in that underlying system then mean that it goes back to the justice system and that we're just pushing forward um, the thought that we're trying to get people help and, and services. So I, I don't have direct comments on how I can make the mental health system better, but I do understand that um, in Brooklyn, it was, you know, some people criticized the fact that I did not require people who were coming in for mental health issues to actually complete mental health services before I actually um, dismissed their cases. And so that is, a, I think, a step forward um, in that regard, and um, I'm going to, and I'm glad you raised it, I'm going to think uh, more carefully about how we can uh, make sure that the, when we provide services that they're done in culturally competent ways. Well, the thanks for your question. I, I omitted this in my presentation. Again, Corrections is not putting this data out anymore, but the last I looked, 70% of female inmates had an Axis one diagnosis. Um, one in three of the total population, meaning a major mental illness either presently or history of, and almost half of all inmates are taking some form of psychotropic medication. So uh, again, that goes back to my point that we're, we're criminalizing mental health problems. We're not investing in community supports. I mean, women now cost 70,000 a year out of that one, what did I say, 165 million. Um, those dollars could be better spent in community services that are culturally competent, that are trauma-informed, that promote better um, outcomes than putting people in cages. Thank you. Thank you, and let's, um, I wanna thank the audience, and I wanna thank our panelists for a very interesting discussion on this very important issue of criminal justice reform. Carla, lunch now? Uh, yes. Uh, so, so lunch is uh, served, uh, so, so, so thank you, panelists. Oh, I was saying, I was hoping you get some questions. <laughs>